glory, risen, conquering Son, endless is the victory, thou, O death, hast won, and no more we doubt of thee, glorious Prince of life. Life is not without Thee, aid us in our strife. Matthew chapter 16, please. Matthew chapter 16. I have, uh, I have actually changed my, my message that I was going to preach today. And um, I was going to preach on something actually that had a 10-minute video that went with it. So come back maybe next week or the week after when I preach it. It was a little more toward Easter, uh, that type of a message, so I put it off because of that. But it's, um, anyway, just sometimes God just kind of works on your heart to change things. And this is one of those days. So if I seem to mess up or, or anything like that, you wouldn't know the difference anyway. But if I did, it's because I, I've changed my message this morning. Uh, when I got up, I thought, no, 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 I'm going to teach on something. I'm going to do some, a little bit of teaching here today. So if you, want, if you came out to hear me yell, that'll be maybe next week. I'll yell next week and I'll preach and, and call you names. But I want to do some teaching along, along the way with preaching. And this is an important subject that I, I, I feel that, I, that needs to be done with, uh, dealt with. Uh, so Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Uh, Jesus speaking unto his uh, lead disciple, the Apostle Peter, and he said, I say un also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Father, again, we thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, to catch the vision that you have. Help us to, to heed the words of your Son, Jesus Christ, and uh, Lord, help us to see the importance of church in every generation. And Father, help us to be a part of it, Lord. Help us not to be against it, but a part of it. Lord, that we be in your will. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so like, like baptism, the meaning and the purpose of church, it's, it can be a contentious issue at times. And um, people will, will argue over church. Some people try to purposely avoid church because they don't want to talk about the topic or, or anything like that. A lot of people will say, you know, I'm a Christian, therefore church doesn't mean much because I'm all about Christ. Okay, that would be all right, except for one thing. Christ was all about the church. <laughs> he says, I'm, I'm going to give my life, we're going to look at this, for the church. So obviously, if Christ was going to give his life for the church, it meant a lot to him. Because you don't just give your life for anything. You know, if you're going to die and people say, oh, I die for my country, that means their country meant a lot to him. Some people will die for their family because their family means a lot to them. Christ gave himself for his church. That means it means a lot to him. So for a person to say, and I, I get it, because we look at churches, and you look out there at churches, and they're all filled with people like us. They're imperfect people, and sometimes uh, they're not always the, the nicest people. I, I like a church that's happy and, and, and warm and glowing and everything else like that. Face it, sometimes we just don't feel up to it, do we? And sometimes we do have to put on a brave face or we do our best. Sometimes we have people who, who become saved, who accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they come from, from very, very horrific backgrounds. And uh, they, they've, they're, they're, you know, I get together with the men, and I, I keep telling the men, and I mean this, I said, we're all warped and twisted from our past in one way or another. We need to get into the Word as men, and we need to share some things and be honest with them, with each other, because we re really need to be straightened out by the Lord Jesus Christ. But to get there, you have to understand and admit the fact that you are not perfect, you are not okay. That you have to, if you were okay, then why did Christ have to die on the cross for us? Okay? Why did God have to expend His best treasure, His Son, Jesus Christ, to come to this, this filthy earth filled with sin? It's because we are not okay. So we need to get straightened out. So I looked at this in this church. That, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't want to get out to church. Another reason, perhaps, and I'm just imagining this, perhaps another reason that people don't want to come out to church is because of this commitment. And we don't like commitment. You know, We don't like uh, uh, doing things. We're not... Years ago, 
years ago, I guess there was, life was much more committed. You had to be. Today we have more options. Today we have technologies we never had before. I can call it in, literally. I can just, I can go to work and, and not even, I can be in my pajamas and my fuzzy little slippers and stuff like that behind my, my, my secular job. Uh, I, I can just get up at the last minute. But you see, I couldn't years ago. I had to get up early. I had to shave. I had to get ready, get dressed. I had to get in the car or, or you have to use public transit, whatever you do. You had to do that. There was commitment involved just to get to work. And that was our life. That was our mind frame. If you, it didn't matter what you worked on, you had to be there because if you weren't, things just didn't happen. And you couldn't call it in. You just couldn't do that. So the commitment today is very challenging. And it's, it's human nature. It's just human nature that if you can call it in, you do. And, uh, or you do something you would rather do rather than something that maybe you don't like that has to be done. And we, we, we live in that kind of land. Well, here's the thing with church is that there's a lot of people is like, oh man, you know, I'm all about Christ, I'm not about church. And sometimes, as I said, I, they have different reasons for that. Maybe they've been hurt by a church. And I understand that. People get hurt by churches. Some people have been horrifically hurt by churches. But a lot of the time that I talk to people, they've never even been out to church. They don't have any interest. They've been out once or twice, and, and they're just not committed. They don't want to commit. And that's what kind of holds a lot of people back. So I want us to look a little bit at church, and I want us to see... It was so important as we look here uh, at, at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus turns and he says to his lead disciple, the apostle Peter, he says, and upon this rock I will build my church. He did not say, I'm going to build it upon Peter. Oh, good night. If you build a church on Peter, I mean, who was the one who, who betrayed, or not betrayed him, that was Judas. Who was the one who denied him when he needed him the most? It was Peter. Who was the one who actually cussed and swore to this girl by, by the fire there because he, he didn't want to be seen to be a part of Jesus' band? It was Peter. Are you going to build a church on him? I wouldn't because he was not that solid. He was not the solid rock. Who's the solid rock? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the solid rock. Okay. What he's saying, he says, upon this uh, profession, if you go back to the verse 17, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Thou art, uh, thou art uh, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And you go back again, you say, well, what, what exactly is he talking about? What, what was so great that, that God the Father had, had made known to Peter? And you go back to verse 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what the church is based on. He made a profession uh, uh, of faith there. Uh, Peter did. And Jesus, right after the next verse, said, he said, hey, that you well said, that blessed are you. Blessed are you because he says, you got that from the Father in heaven. You didn't come up with that. That's not man's philosophies. And so you look at it again there, and, and what Peter said there in verse 16, he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God, okay? You're the anointed one. You're the one that was prophesied. Most, uh, most of the bulk of that Old Testament was prophesying, pushing forward that the Messiah, the Deliverer would come. And Peter said, uh, he got an, uh, an epiphany, if you will, from God the Father. He said, you, you are that Christ. You are that bedrock that we've been looking for. And then you go over there to verse 18, and he says, uh, Jesus says to him, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, which in the, in the Greek is, you're talking, he says, Peter means a stone. He says, upon this rock, not a stone, but upon this rock. What rock? The rock that I am the Messiah. The one that I am the Christ. I am the promised one. I am the Son of God. He says, that's what it's based on. He says, I will build my church because he is the one it's built upon. And then people say, well, I don't think the church is all that important. It was to Jesus. It was very much so to Jesus. And also to God the Father and the Holy Spirit that he put it into the holy writing here. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I mean, you could put gates all around a, a, a church where, where there's born again baptized believers who are actually committed and they say we're, we're going to get involved in God's plan and they're, going to, and they're going to evangelize in their community and you can put all kinds of obstacles around it you can put all kinds of fencing around I'm not talking about the building I'm talking about the people themselves the building blocks of the church and that church is going to bust those wide open if they're going to stay true to Christ they're going to be empowered by Christ and there's going to be amazing things happen 
So people say, and, and I do, I watch. I watch what's going on and I read what's going on with the laws that are going on trying to, to hinder churches and everything else, but I don't worry about them. I want to be aware of them, but I don't worry about them because I look at this verse here, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Do you think anybody in Ottawa is going to prevail against it? No. Do you think anybody in Queen's Park is going to prevail? They can't. They can't. Do you think anybody locally is going to do it? Do you think the police are going to shut down the Church of the Living God? They've tried for 2,000 years. How's that working? Not very good. Oh, they put us to death. They take away our homes. They take away everything else. And I, as I said, I'm aware, aware of that because I don't want any of that to happen. But I'll tell you something. Every time people try to do stuff like that, it just keeps growing all the more. Actually, in fact, and I don't want this because I, I don't want misery, but I'll tell you this much. Sometimes when things are easy going, the church falls asleep. And it's only when we're, we're razzled up and we start to really take account of, of what's going on and what really matters. And all of a sudden, God's spirit, just like he did with Peter there where he made that profession, he says, thou art the Christ. Sometimes we, we wake up, a church wakes up and said, hey, we serve Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, and we can put the newspapers away, we can put the internet away, and we put all this away and stop worrying about all these conspiracy theories, and we can look at the true and almighty God, and the gates of hell will not prevail against His church, because it's His church, you see. It's not, we're, we're a part of it. I'm a, I get to be a member of a local church, but it's not my church, and it's not your church, it's His church. So I'm like, okay, I feel better, and we need that. We need that reckoning once in a while. We need that, that, that preaching and that teaching. We need to read the Bible once in a while. It's good to read your Bible, by the way, not just on Sunday, but through the rest of the week. And we need to be preaching it and, and studying it and everything else because that's where the power comes from. That power from the Spirit of God comes through His Word. And so we look at this. So we look at church, and the word church uh, we, we see it used, uh, th dotted throughout the New Testament. And this is, by the way, is the first mention of it here in the New Testament. It's, uh, if you go by the, uh, the rule of uh, first mention here, Jesus is the one that mentions it. He says it's his church. He tells us the power, he tells us the job, it's going to be a spiritual warfare. He said the gates of hell, he didn't say, say the gates of Rome. They had a problem with Rome back in those days because Rome was over top of them. I mean, Rome was the power at that time. I mean, what a colossal power it was. He said, but he didn't say the gates of Rome. or the, He didn't say the gates of, of those Jewish non-believers out there. He, he didn't say the synagogues were going to give us problems. He didn't say, he says, look, I'll go right to the very brink, to the point of hell. Hell won't even prevent it. Even Satan and, and all the things that he has brought judgment upon us, he says, there's nothing that can be done because I'm in charge here. Aren't you glad? Aren't you? And you thought it was Donald Trump that was in charge, didn't you? You were, oh, I'm so thankful, Donald Trump. Oh, maybe Donald Trump will be president and everything. Listen, folks. He, he's over, no, he's not, believe it or not. He's already been president, and we saw what happened. Joe Biden, maybe Joe Biden will be our super our superstar. Maybe we'll come, maybe somebody else, maybe Nikki Haley, maybe, and we go on that, and I'll, that's all I see on TV over and over and over and over and over again. And every once in a while, I turn it off, and every once in a while, I open the book, and then I read this, and I said, no, you know what? There have been stronger people than the people that are being mentioned right now as leadership contenders. There have been stronger people throughout history, and not even they could contain the church that is under the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I look at this, and I think that, that first mention, and this, this is new to his disciples. His disciples were Jews, and they were looking for the Messiah, and they were looking, these, these men, Peter was looking for the Messiah. Okay, he wanted the Messiah to come because he thought right at that moment, once the Messiah came, that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom. Of course, they missed out and they didn't look at some of the other scriptures, so the Old Testament scriptures they had, which says, especially in Daniel, which says that the Messiah must be cut off. And it talks about him being put to death. He must be cut off for a season. He has to be cut off for seven years. And they, they, they didn't get that part, but they just thought he was going to come. He's going to usher in the kingdom and everything else. And so did John the Baptist. So did some of the others, too. They just believed that he was going to steamroll it in. But when he didn't, uh, Jesus had to actually tell him, give him some information. He says, no, 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 I got something else coming up. And before I, and he hasn't finished with the Jews yet. Oh, he's going to finish with the Jews, but he hasn't finished with them yet. He says, but in the meantime, I'm going to be cut off, but there's something else I want to talk about. And so we see here in verse 18, he says, and I will build my church. 
So there's something else that's coming into play that they didn't see in the Old Testament. God knew it all along. It was not a surprise to him. He said, no, no, the sun's going to be cut off. He's going to be hanged on a cross. This month, at the end of the month, the last day of the month, we're going to be celebrating the Resurrection Sunday because Jesus Christ came back from the dead. And so because Jesus Christ came back from the dead, I take really, um, I, I take really seriously verse 18 when he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against this church. Because here's a man who even the grave could not hold. All right, I've never met a person that the grave could not hold. I have a lot of family, a lot of friends. The older I get, the more family, more friends I have that are six feet under right now. The grave holds them. But here's one who the grave couldn't hold. He said three days, three nights. He, 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 actually, he actually just put it out there. and He, he said, here's, here's the, only, the only sign I'm going to give to the Jews. He says, just like Jonah was three days and three, three uh, nights in the, the, the whale's belly, he says, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. He said, that's the only, that's the only sign I'm going to give to you. And he says, so he says, mark my words. Boy, that's quite a challenge. Could you say that? If I was to die right now, I could not say in three days, three nights, Mike McDonald's going to rise from the dead because, you know, unless the Lord comes in the meantime, I'm going to still be down there, okay? And that my body is, not my soul, but my body's going to be there. But Jesus put out a challenge, and he said to the Jews, the non-believing Jews, he said, here's my challenge. And if I don't live up to it, then I'm a liar. I'm a false prophet, and I deserve to have been put to death. But he said, I'm going to be put to death, and after three days, three nights, I'm coming back. Praise God, he came back. I'm so excited. I mean, I, I don't need another religion. I don't need another philosophy. I don't need another theory in my life to get by on. Because I have the Word of God, and I have the person who is in the centerpiece of the Word of God. His name is Jesus. He did what he said, and they, they still can't come up with an explanation why there is an empty tomb there. Because it, to admit it, you'd have to admit that he was true, and that he was a, a true prophet, and that he is God, the Son of God. So, folks, if you put your, your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, hold your head up high, not in pride and arrogance of yourself, but because you serve the Almighty God, and He's true, and His name is Jesus Christ. He came in the form of, a in a form of the flesh. If you're not yet a born-again Christian, or you don't know what I'm talking about, just hang in there and start praying for yourself, because I'll tell you something, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He can't see it. You'll never see it. You'll never attain to that if you're not a born-again Christian. If you're not born through the Spirit of God, you can't do it by flesh. You can't pay enough money, you know, and I've said that many times. I pull out this wallet, you know. I can't even get the wallet out. It's so, uh, it's so big, you know. I have so much money in there. I'm going to go see. I've got a few bucks in here, okay? I won't show you how much money. Uh, you'll be jealous. And you'll, you'll, but I, I, I got a few, Okay. But you know what? I could, I could take, we could, we could pass the hat around. Brother Joe, we could have, we'll start with you. We'll, you got the most money here, so we'll start at the top and move down, okay? And then we'll get to me, and then we'll move around, and we could pass the hat around, okay? And then we could say to God, okay, is this enough? Is this, would this buy me into heaven? And he says, well, wait a minute, you, you, you've got to sin. And I'm a holy God, and my heaven is perfect, and I always, it's going to be perfect, and this is the way it's going to be, and you're demanding to come in here and to be a part of this? You're going to be a part of this? I don't think so. You need something much more than a few dollars, especially Canadian. Maybe American, but definitely not Canadian dollars is going to get you there, folks. All right? And then we'll, what's that, brother? Maple syrup. Maple syrup. Okay, we can trade in whatever works. Salt, maple syrup, I'll take anything these days. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to understand something is that this is precious, what Jesus Christ has done for us. He said, I will go to the cross. I will bleed. I will die out on that cross. I will offer myself. I'll let these men, I'll, I'll let, I'll let my, one of my, my 12 chosen disciples betray me. He already knew. He actually announced it. And we'll look at that later on in a couple weeks from now about the betrayer, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot. He says, I, I already know what that guy's going to do. He says, I know what these guys are going to do. And he says to Peter, he says, I know you're going to deny me. You're going to say, I didn't know the guy. Everybody's going to just flee from me. And you're all going to leave me all by myself. And he's, he, Jesus already knew this. This is how much he loves you. And this is how much he wants you to come into the fold and trust in him as your, as your Lord and Savior and be born again. Because he knew all of this. He says, I know I'm going to go to the cross. I know I'm going to be beaten. 
I know people are going to laugh at me and they're going to spit upon me. And I know that by the, the time that it's over with, they're not going to be able to recognize me as a human being because I'm going to be so battered and bruised. And then you're going to nail me to some wood and you're going to suspend me up in heaven or up, up the earth, off the earth, between heaven and earth. You're going to put me on that cross to the point where I can hardly breathe. I've got to push up just to get my air, my breathe. Uh, breath, and then eventually I'm not even going to have that, and I'm going to give up the ghost, so I'm going to die, and I'm going to do it for you and for me. What an amazing God. i tell you something, folks. I wouldn't do it for you, and you wouldn't do it for me. I wouldn't do it. Uh, if, if I knew ahead of time what he had to go through, and if I knew that I had to go through that, I wouldn't do it for you because I, I just know the weakness of my own flesh. I couldn't do it. How much love it took uh, to do that. I mean, it's amazing. And then on top of all that, and we know this story too, if you've been around in the scriptures, is that that wasn't the worst of it. <laughs> that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it is when he's hanging there, everybody's abandoning him. Nobody really understands what's going on. He's got, he's got his mother and some other women, and John's there, finally shows up, and, and they're all crying. They're, they have no hope and everything else, and they're all looking at him. They don't understand what's going on. And he, it's just when he's all by himself and he's dying, he's about ready to give up, what happens, the day goes dark, and what happens is the father turns his back on his own son and said, I can't look at you. I can't look at you, boy. I can't look at you, son, because now you are a sinner. You have the sin of the world upon you, and I cannot look upon sin. I'm a holy being. And he turned his back on his son for the only time in all eternity that he ever did that, for that moment on the cross, because of you and because of me. What a sacrifice that was given. And I look at that and I'm thinking, you know, when I heard that and I, I heard it preached that I wasn't perfect, I knew when the first time I heard that it, it, sitting there in the pew, I realized I'm just a lost sinner. I need this God. I need this God that would love me so much that would do all that for me. What a God. I don't need, I don't need more religion. I don't need no more rules and regulations. Unless they're His, I will do whatever He I want Him to be my Lord and Savior. I don't want man's ways anymore because they just don't add up. So I look at this and then at the end of it all, when Jesus said, or I'm sorry, when Peter says that in, in Matthew 16, 16, when he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, the next thing that he says, make bold statements, verse 18, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, thou art a stone, and upon this rock, talking about that profession that he is the Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus Christ is building it. He says, I will build my church. He goes, you're not doing it. Sometimes I, I, I you know, we, we, we live in this, this world where we think we're doing all this stuff. All we do when we go out, and if you go out and you go in the community and you hand out, which we'll do, and we'll put in mailboxes, we'll, we'll, or we'll talk to people on the streets and we'll talk to them about Jesus Christ, or we'll visit them in the hospitals, or we'll visit them in different areas and we'll talk to people about Jesus Christ. All we're doing is getting out the word. We're not building anything because it's Jesus Christ that does all the work. Okay, we're just his mouthpieces. Okay, we're just his feet here on this earth. That's all we are. Let's not think that we can talk somebody into heaven. You can't. I can't use any argument that's going to surprise you people. I can't, uh, I can't bring in atheists and we'll have debates. I, I have no use for debates because they don't really work because either you're going to believe it or you're not. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of the heart, whether you're going to put your trust in Jesus Christ or whether you're going to reject him. Or are you going to play a game where I'll take part of Jesus and then I'll take part of the world or my own way and I'll kind of swing. That doesn't work either because with Jesus, it's him or it's no way at all. It's one or the other. So we have to make a choice and he's always called for a decision to be made. So I made my choice. When I looked at it, I said, well, okay, so I'm following this, this Lord Jesus Christ. And then he talks about this, this church, this church. And as I said before, I've had the, the word church, it, it's... Uh, you know, I'll talk to somebody, uh, you know, I'll say, hey, listen, are, are you a Christian? Are you, you know Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, I know Jesus Christ. What church do you go to? Then there's a silence. <laughs> and usually a pause. Well, okay, and I'm not saying this person's not a born-again Christian. I don't know, but I do know what their view of the church is. And then when I go with their view of the church is, I start to understand what their view of the Word of God is because I know what the Word of God says about the church, Okay. This is not made up by man. Jesus said, I will build my church. Well, then I want to be involved. I want to be a building block in that church. And he's, again, as I said, he does the building. We just have to be faithful to go out and get out the word and let 
and let the chips fall where they may because he's the builder, okay? He's the builder. So we look at this. So the word church, what does it mean? Well, the word church comes from a Greek word, and we've used it many times here in this church. It comes from the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia, made up of two words. Uh, ek, which is ek, means out, get out, get out of. And kaleo, kale, uh, ekklesia. Kaleo is the, the other uh, Greek word. that Put them together, you got ekklesia, out, uh, okay? So the one is to be called out of. If you are a born-again Christian, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then Christ has separated you out. You are out of this world. You understand that? So when I tell you, Tara, when I say you're out of this world, I mean you're out of this world, okay? You're out of this world. All right. Well, then we, now you got it. So we are out of this world. And Jesus, we see elsewhere in Scripture, we're in the world. We're still living here, but we're not of the world. It's like we're visitors. That's another thing that got me going. Once, once I realized that Christ has called me out, talking about the ecclesia, the church, I'm called out, I'm a called out one, I realize that I don't have to let the things of this world get to me. I don't have to be so invested in the world anymore. And, I, and it's really made my life a lot easier. I hope it makes your life easier too as you get into the Word of God. Because the news agencies and everybody else tries to pull you back into the concerns of the day, the world, and you're worried and you're scared and everything else. And then, you, yeah. then they get you all doing things and you're angry and, you're, and they get you all called up into the things. And I realized when I look back at this, wait a minute, I'm just a visitor here now, okay? There, there was a time I was, you know, this was, I was a citizen of planet Earth. I'm now a citizen of God in heaven, okay? I'm a visitor here. I don't belong here anymore. I'm out of this world, okay? I'm an alien, all right? People are saying, where's the aliens? They're spending a lot of money. They just did another report. They just determined, I guess, that there are no spacemen out there flying around from other planets. They had to do that. They, I don't know how much money they spent on these things, but they go over and over and over again trying to find them. I'm thinking, hello, alien right here, okay? Not from another planet, from another, from another, from eternity, okay? And not because Jesus Christ. And no, I'm not crazy. No, I'm not loopy. I think the people who are loopy are the people who are sending things out in outer space trying to find little green men out there. But uh, if they want to, go ahead. It's interesting. It's fun. But it, it's not meaningful. I just found that I'm called out. That's his church. So in a, in, a, in a nutshell, overall, generically speaking, we're called out the moment we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But then Jesus has local church. And that's the, 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 uh, the, the crux of it. That's the one that makes the most impact on this world today is that Jesus, generically speaking, it's like when I say the family today has problems. I'm talking generically. But in reality, I'm talking about individual families. You understand that. There will be times you'll see that they'll talk about the church of God or the church of, of Jesus Christ. It's talking generically, everything's under him. But really, when you start looking at the practical boots on the ground in the scriptures, he's talking to local, independent, local churches that are autonomous, that are just independent in there. So that's the word called out, and if you look at that. So if you've got your Bibles, go over to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Looking at the importance of church, I want you to see, first of all, I want you to see how it's used uh, generically, in general. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Ah, oh, isn't that great? Love your wives. And then you ever go to a wedding? You ever go to this wedding? They're in love, aren't they? They have no idea, especially if they're a young couple and this is their first time around. They have no idea what they're up against. Oh, I love this person. Yeah, yeah, I really love Yeah, you have no idea, especially if you get kids. You have no idea what you get. If you have financial difficulty, you don't have a clue what's going on. And, uh, but you will. You will. Hold on. And so he uses this as an example, okay? Talk, you see he's going to bring in the church. Husbands. Love your wives. It, by the way, husbands, is it easy to love your wife? Yeah, yeah okay, Doug, you're well trained. <laughs> All right, yeah, a little slow. And he's looking at, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. It, it's, I'll just, okay, I'll, I'll save you, you guys some, some, some trouble. I find it's not always easy to love my wife because sometimes I love myself more. Has that ever happened to you? No, don't answer, Doug. <laughs> 
No, it never happened to me. I never loved my son. I always put my wife first. But this is, but this is why it's commanded. God does not have to command something that it's easy for us to do that we're already doing naturally. He commands us the things that we're not doing. And, or we will have problems with husbands, love your wives. And it's not easy because, again, you love yourself. And the, it's nice when everything's uh, rosy and everything's going great. But when the clouds come over us. There's health problems, financial problems, there's all kinds of problems that come out there. And he says, but regardless, regardless, love your wives. And then he gives the example. Okay, how are we to love our wives and I didn't mean this to be a, a, a sermon on, on men today, but it just happens. I didn't do it. God did this. He links it together. He goes, even as Christ also loved the church. Well, isn't that nice? Jesus loved the church. I love my wife. Everything's good. Just don't read the last few words in that verse. Okay, as long as you stay away from reading the whole counsel of God. He says, and gave himself for it. And if you know the rest of the scripture, the earlier part of the scripture, and I've already talked about it, how he went to the cross, how he was abused, how he was used, how he was lied about, everything that's going on, and yet he never, he was like a lamb to the slaughter. He never spoke out. He was the one who had the right to speak out. He kept his silence because he was here to observe or to, to obey the Father's will and to die for the sins of the world. He was there for a reason. It's a good thing he wasn't there for himself. If he was there for himself, Jesus was a human being like the rest of us. He became a human being. like the, He's always eternal, always perfect, but he got an earthly body from his mother, uh, Mary, and he became one of us. And just like one of us, he, he didn't commit suicide. He didn't, have, uh, he didn't hate his life. He didn't hate anything like that. He was a sacrifice for us. He gave himself for us. And then that's what he's saying there in Ephesians. He says, husbands, love your wives in that same manner. Boy, you, you never look at that again, uh, the same way again. Because it's like, wow, I mean, I have to, you know, did, did Jesus have to put up with uh, some things? He had to put up with his disciples. The ones who were closest. He spent three and a half years with these men, training these men. He, he did, well, what else could he do? You know, he, give me that bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Like, and I'm just putting in today's lay, layman's terms. Is that, and he just kept fe feeding 3,000 or 5,000 people, depends where he was at the any given. That's nothing. Just give me a bucket of food. Give me some fishes. Give me some, some, some bread. And that's what he did. And, and he could do miracles. And they saw that. He could walk on water. They saw that. He did all these amazing things. Lazarus, come forth. And he comes forth from the dead. And he, the people that came, they couldn't see. He gave them instant sight. They could not walk all their lives. Now they're adults and they raised them up. Lee, he would raise you up like that, like nothing. That's the power of the Christ. So he's on the cross. He's got all this power, and yet he gives it all up for us. And then, of course, in, in Ephesians, he says, okay, men, I want you to give it all up for your wife. Now, i got to be careful because my wife's here this morning. Honey, go downstairs. She should, she should be downstairs looking after the children. And, and that, but, you know, because I can honestly say I've never lived up to this challenge. I haven't. I've, I try, and it's an encouragement, but I can't be perfect. But praise God, Jesus Christ was when he was dealing about his church. So he says, it says here uh, very, very clearly, he said that he, he loved the church and he gave himself for the church. So let me ask you this. Is church important? It must be. If you're a Christian, now if you're not a Christian, then it's not important then Christ is not even important. But if you're a Christian and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it should be important. So sometimes we need to, to look into the Scriptures. And I, it's just, when I was a younger man pastoring, I would, I would do a lot of preaching on the church. I haven't done a lot of teaching or preaching on the church here uh, in comparison to what I used to do. But I, I'll tell you this much. Every once in a while, we need to get centered again. We need to get back and see how important church is. And it's not, you know, it's, it's not, sometimes, again, we think, think it's us. You know, sometimes preachers, and I'll be honest with you because I'm a pastor, is that we're, we're like this Sunday morning. Will people show up? We're, we're, well, wait a minute. It's not on me. Christ builds the church. Will that person get saved? Will they trust the Lord Jesus Christ? Will that person then get baptized? Will they join the church? Will they? Wait a minute. It's not about me. Okay, I'm not the one who loved the church so much that I gave myself for it. And yet you'll see some preachers, they'll sacrifice their whole families for their church. Fools. They didn't read the scripture. 
No, God never expected anybody, man, woman, or child, to ever give their life for the church. He didn't. Check the scriptures for yourselves. He did that for us. He's already done it. Why would I have to give my life? He's already given himself for the church. What we are to be is faithful followers to him, to his word. And yes, is there times when we might be faced with, uh, with martyrdom? Yeah, it's happened many a times. But that's my commitment to Christ. It's my personal commitment to Christ, but not the church. The church as a whole. You people like that, you know what? My best thing that I can do as a pastor for you is my best thing is to, to give you the word of God faithfully and to pray for you faithfully. And to be there if, if you need something to, to, to try to talk to you and, and, and listen to you. and That's all I can do. But as far as changing your life around, I can't do that. Because my own, my own life's messed up. Do you understand that? I'm not perfect. Every day I'm all messed up. Every day. I can't, I can't lie to you. It's, it's, you hang around with me long enough, you'll understand. Okay, I drink far too much coffee in the morning. And I get all pumped up. And it's like... Uh, you, 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 yeah. Anyway, I'm getting off on tangents, but you understand the point. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church is important. So the church generic, okay? Uh, generic, when he talks about it as his church, he's talking about all the little local churches, everybody that's been called out and, and that. But what God's plan is, and we'll see this in Scripture also, is he doesn't want to just call you out so that you're his and that you're going to go to all eternity in heaven, but he also wants you to be a part of a local assembly on earth because that's how you're going to grow. That's how you're going to be accountable. That's how, you, how, that's how you're going to be disciplined and, and, and get into the, into the Word of God. Because anybody can be a Christian at home when nobody sees them. Let me tell you something. I'm a better employee when I have to go into the office than when I'm working from home. Okay? Being honest with you. I might slip down for an extra cup of coffee. I can't do that when the boss is watching me. Oh, my. Just after, you know, at my age, you have to go to the bathroom a lot. You know, you drink a lot of coffee and stuff. I'm always going to the bathroom. I had, I remember one shift, and, and, and there was, this is Sea of Cubicles. This is when we were still working at, at, in the office. And the boss, the, the general manager, he was a ni- he's still my boss. He's still a nice man, great man. And, and thing, but he had a window cut into his, his cubicle, okay? And so he could see things. And I had to, for me to go to the bathroom, I had to go out of the, gro- the area into the, the common area where the bathrooms were. And I remember, because I, I drink a lot of coffee, and uh, so I have to get up, and I, I'm, I'm not a young man anymore. I'm like the old guy. I was, no, there's one guy older than me, okay? In, jo, Brother Joe, in his 80s. This guy was in his 80s, and he was still working in, in this office. And he's still working there today, from what I'm told, in another area. But anyway, other than that, I'm the old guy, okay? So I have to go. So I had to go to the bathroom, okay? So I got to go to the bathroom. I'm normally not thinking about it until I look over to the cubicle, and the boss is like this. And he's, I can see he's probably looking at this and how many, he's probably, he's probably got a little chart board. He's like, how many times is this guy going by here? And I realize that when I'm accountable, when I have to get out and assemble with the, my fellow employees, uh, I'm a little bit more alert as to what I'm doing and how, uh, how, how my attention is to the work at hand. But when I'm at home, ha, <laughs> ha, let me tell you something. My bathroom has this, it's an ensuite, okay? I am, I am just that close, this close to the bathroom. I have no problem. And there's no guy going like this, what's going on? You know, they, they, there's nothing like that. It's great. It's freedom, man. It's freedom. But here's the other thing, is that by doing that, I just find myself not as in the game as I should be. And it's a little easier to, you know, to kind of look out the window and daydream and stuff. When, you're, when people are watching you and, you're, and people are, you, you see the people that you're accountable for and they're accountable for you, we all kind of seem to rise it up a bit. So there's a practical thing about being a, a member of a church. And that is, is that you're a local call out assembly and so you, all of a sudden you see each other and you can also tell when somebody's not feeling well. Again, you can't always tell through a text message if the per, how the person's doing. In, in church, the same thing with a local called out a church or called out ones is that you can tell when somebody's having problems. Maybe they're having problems with sin. Maybe it's a problem with their health. Maybe they're having a problem with their relationship. But you can start to see it on their face. Maybe they'll tell you. They'll, they'll put up a brave face, but maybe you'll start to see it. Where? But you can't do that when you, everybody's scattered and they're all in their own house and their own little silos. And that's not the way God wants it to be. He wants us to be accountable to each other and to be able to pray and to know each other, know each other by name. And, but again, eh, that takes effort, doesn't it? It took effort for you folks to come out here this morning. I understand that. 
And there, I understand that there's an excuse not to come out here this morning. Because, you know, hey, listen, you lost an hour of sleep. Boy, and some of you look like you lost an hour of sleep, <laughs> let me tell you. Lost an hour of sleep. Oh, and then all, we were going to have horrible weather and everything else. And that, and then you look at the time and then, is this, what time is it actually? Is it afternoon? Yes. I'm looking at that clock there. It's 11 o'clock. I'm serious. I'm like, I've got lots of time. I'll just stall this message. Oh my, I'm sorry, folks. Okay, I'll, um, I, I never, you know, it doesn't mean anything anyway, the clocks, when you're preaching. But I, and I'll, I'll bring it home, okay? Because I, by the way, I had a whole lot more in my notes. But I just, I get so excited when I talk about Jesus Christ being the head of the church. And I'm talking about generically, but if you've got your Bibles, look over to 1 Corinthians 16, and I'll just close here. Because there's so, and there's so many verses here I could use. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. That's it. Verse 1. I want you to see something that's important. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints. So they were taking up a collection for people who were suffering and, and poor and, and starving. And he says, as I have given order, okay, and this is the Apostle Paul. He's not, he's not a pastor. He's an apostle. He's above. We don't have these apostles anymore. He's above. He's the one who God used to get the church started. He says, I have given order to the, what's the next word? Church is. The church is. You will find, and we, I can take you through all kinds of scripture. I can take you through Ma, uh, uh, the churches of Macedonia and 2 Corinthians. I can take you through the churches of Judea that are found in, in the book of Galatians. I can take you through the churches of Asia, which are found in Revelation. Church is. So when you find it, generically speaking, when God is speaking, or the, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son, is speaking, he talks about the church. He's talking generically about all his churches, all his people that he's saved and he's called out. However, you're going to find, and we just don't have time because I ran out of it here, but you're going to find that when he's talking to real people, one-on-one -on -one gr groups of people, he's talking to churches. So there's no church of Rome. There's no church of England, although we create them all. There's no church of London, unless maybe we were the very first church they started. There's churches here. There's many churches here. There's more than one churches here because they're local called out assemblies. We're not some mystical, unknown body. And I, I will take time later on to develop that and show you that from Scripture itself, that they knew who people were. They knew their names. Even when we get to the point in, uh, in Acts, when you have on the day of Pentecost, when you have people getting saved, I mean, lots of people saved, 3,000 people saved. Even before that, you find out that there was 120 people, and it uses the word named. They named 120 people at the beginning uh, of the church age. 120, and it uses the word name. They knew their names. And after the, the preaching from, from Peter and the other apostles, after uh, 3,000 people accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and got baptized, it says they were added unto them. Unto who? That 120 people, they had names. They knew who they were. They were local. They knew who they were. They, they could see each other. They were in the same area. That way they could pray for each other. What I'm trying to say to you, folks, is this. And I'll leave it with this. Is that the church is so important to God that he sent his son on a mission to create a church. A church that is going to be made up of many local churches. A church that's going to call people out from this world of sin. That these people who, who are part of this world, they're going to get saved, they're going to be transformed, they're going to be born again into God's kingdom. And not just left not just left to, to, to wonder what it's all about and to wander the earth for the rest of their life, but actually get involved in his church a, at the local church level so that they would grow, so that they could hear the preaching, that they can see each other, they could, they could help each other, pray for each other, they could support one another. And yes, once in a while, they need to be disciplined. We need a kick in the pants once in a while. And that's another thing we do. And again, as I said before, when I work from home, I get disciplined once in a while if I, if I don't do something right on a case. But I'll tell you something, when I'm there and they, they see me there, I'm under more discipline and I actually perform better. We have a lot of people today who are Christians who are not obedient to Christ's church. 
They like to get away from it. They like to do their own thing. And the thing is, is just as Jesus said to the men, he says, I want you to love your wives just like Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. We are to sacrifice and give ourselves for each other. That's what we're supposed to do. And I can show you scripture after scripture how it was carried out and commanded that we are to pray for one another and carry out for each other, to help each other. Folks, I need you, okay? Not just as a pastor. Even when I wasn't a pastor, I was a church member. I need my church. I need to be a part of a flock. I need people to know who I am. I need to be able to, to be disciplined. I need to be preached to. I need to be uplifted. There's times when I'm down and I need somebody, I really need, I'm, I'm sinking, man. There's times when I'm sinking, you get in deep in despair. You know, you all know what I'm talking about. You get those points where you just say, there's, this seems like there's no answer for my life and you just get into despair. You need someone, you need a brother or sister in Christ to reach down in the name of Jesus Christ and anchor you and pull you back up. You can't do that if you're living in a silo. You need to see people. You need to be out. God has a plan. It's called his church. Father.